Welcome back to our series on introductory statistics. I'm Mark Ledbetter, and this is lecture video 28, part A. We are still in section 8.1. This is part four of that. Uh, we've been learning how to estimate mu when sigma is known. We're going to continue with that in this video. And so uh, this is, again, a pre-recorded video, so I hope you enjoy the slower pace. In this video, we're going to review some characteristics of a confidence interval and then do another example. So we have some assumptions. We have, uh, so the first assumption that must be met is that we have a simple random sample of size n from a population of x values. So x is whatever our population uh, is what we're trying to measure okay so for the type of confidence interval we're doing now which this is uh, confidence intervals for the mean mu when Sigma is known Sigma is the population standard deviation mu is the population mean. So it's these are true values for the whole population. Usually we don't know these. Okay? So when the population's an infinite size or practically infinite, we rarely know the actual values of these parameters. And so again, what we do is we take a sample. In this case, it needs to be a simple random sample so that whatever n is, if it's 30, then any sample of 30 items out of this population should have the exact same probability of being selected. That's a simple random sample that we discussed in chapter one. Okay, so in order for us to do this type of confidence interval about the mean when sigma is known, the value of sigma is known, has to be known in order for us to use the formulas that we're going to use. There's another way to do a confidence interval that we'll cover next time where we don't know sigma. Okay? And that is the more common case in real life. All right. So if the population of x is normally distributed, then we can use any value of n with this formulas, with the formulas that we're going to cover, okay? Now, from the central limit theorem, if the population of x is either unknown or it is any other distribution, then we need a minimum sample size of 30. So n has to be greater than or equal to 30. So if it doesn't say what type of distribution, or if um, we have a, uh, some other distribution, we could say it's uniform, we could say it's exponential, we could say it's anything, uh, we have to have at least 30 for our sample size. So in this course, we're going to use 30 as our minimum. Now, in actual practice, if you have a highly skewed distribution and it's not mound-shaped, then uh, we might need a sample size of at least 50 or even 100. But for this course, as long as we have 30 or greater, we're going to use uh, these formulas. Okay. So last time we did not talk about the margin of error. The margin of error is usually unknown. Um, so it is the difference between X bar, our sample mean. Sorry about that. Sometimes uh, when I touch the iPad, it uh, does something. So X bar is the sample mean. And mu, of course, is our population mean. So the difference between these two numbers, the absolute 
uh, difference, so the absolute value of that difference. So it doesn't matter if mu is bigger or if x bar is bigger, it's how far apart they are, okay? So that is the margin of error, and we're going to estimate the margin of error. Now a critical value is something else that we need, and for a, con a confidence interval with a confidence level C, our book uses C for confidence level, and I use capital CI for confidence interval, okay? So, um, unfortunately, they both have the word confidence in there, right? So, please try to keep them straight. The confidence interval is an interval, it's a range of values, it's what we're looking for. The confidence level is just how confident we are, usually expressed as a percentage, okay? The critical value, Z sub C, that's what the book uses, is the number such that the value under the normal curve between negative z sub c and positive z sub c, that area equals c. So I've drawn a picture down here, and you'll see that um, it's in the z-axis because it's the standard normal, and we have negative z sub c here and positive z sub c here, and of course the mean of the z-distribution, the standard normal, is zero, and the area under the curve between these two values is going to be C. And I've written it out in notation, the probability that Z is between negative Z sub C and positive Z sub C is C. You're saying, well, what does this do? This is a lot of symbols and maybe it's a little confusing. So we're going to, uh, so let me do a quick example. What if I wanted C was equal to 0.90? All right, well, how do I find z sub c? So what we have is we have negative z sub c here, positive z sub c here, and between, this is c equals 0 0.9000. Now, in order to look up z, negative z sub c in my table, I need to know this area here. If I know this area here, I can look that area or probability up in the table and find negative z sub c directly. So how do I get that? Well, I'm going to take 1 minus 0 0.9, which is going to give me 0 0.1. That's the total area in both of these tails where it's not shaded. That's that total area. Since, since negative z sub c is the same distance away from the mean 0 as positive z sub c, these two areas in the tails are going to be the same. So I'm going to divide this by 2. 0.1 divided by 2 equals 0 0.0500. So this is 0 0.0500. So I'm going to go to my Z table and try to find the closest area inside of 0 0.05. And it turns out, oh, I need to, turns out, that it's right here between 0 0.0505 and 0 0.0495. I follow this area arrow down to the bottom of the table, and it tells me that for point an area of 0 0.05, that the z-score is negative 1.645. So this is negative, oops, negative 1.645. And that means that this z is positive 1.645. Okay, so that's how we find a critical value. Well, that's the end of this video. So please remember to scan your lecture notes before midnight of the day on the course calendar. Uh, if you have questions, by all means, please come to virtual office hours. I am happy to help you. And if you can't do that, then, then by all means, email me. But when you email me, please email me a picture of both the problem, because I may not have access to that problem wherever I am, and a picture of your work, which allows me to know uh, how you're approaching the problem and help you best and the quickest. So um, I'm looking forward to seeing you next time. Until then, stay safe and take care.